Hello, I'm Lizzie Harper from Lizzie Harper Illustration and I'm a freelance botanical and natural history illustrator. Now, in response to a request from one of my YouTube viewers, um, today I'll be talking you through how I go about doing a natural history illustration of a bird. So the bird that I'll be doing is not a particularly glamorous number, um, it's the spotted flycatcher. And the reason for this is because it ties in with a commission that I'm currently working on. So the spotted flycatcher is a, it's got kind of dingy greyish feathers um, and a bit of mottling, but it's in its own way, even though it's not gaudy, it's very beautiful. The approach that I use to paint birds is the same across the board. So if you follow me through this, then that is the way that I would approach the illustrating of any bird, um, any species anywhere. So the equipment you'll need is hot press watercolour paper. Currently I'm working on Fluid 100 by Global Arts, although I also like Stonehenge Aqua by Legion Papers. Um, you'll also need a watercolour box, and this is mine. I use pans and I top them up with tubes. Generally I favour Winsor & Newton watercolours, but there are lots and lots of good brands out there. It doesn't really matter. Um, just as long as you have clean colours. And in terms of paint brushes, I'm sure you all have heard me bang on about this before. I really like, uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna be able to get that in focus. I'll show you later anyway. But I really like Winsor & Newton Series 7 Pure Sable brushes. Um, and these are a size one. I always use the same size. I am always questing for synthetic replacements for the Pure Sable, but Thus far, I haven't found the Holy Grail. Um, if that does interest you, there's a whole series of test videos that are also on my YouTube channel where I compare different um, synthetic brushes. However, that's for a different day. But yeah, so today we'll be looking at the spotted flycatcher and how I go about painting birds. Um, and thank you so much for joining me. Uh, let's get started. I've drawn up the spotted flycatcher, Muschiappa striata, and the reference that I've used is based on an amalgamation of different sources. So a lot of it is based on these photos by an incredibly gifted um, and patient, I'm sure, photographer called Pete Walkden, um, who has given me permission generally to, to work from his photos. Check out his work. It's brilliant. Um, but then there are different details that come from different images. If you are working from reference, then always be sure that you get the permission of the person who took the photo or did the original illustration to work from. What you really don't want to end up doing is um, infringing their copyright, which means copying their photos without permission. Uh, so this one, I wanted it to be eating an insect um, and I also wanted it to be perched on a gravestone. And the reason for this is because the client I'm working for is Cusop Churchyard, which is a local churchyard, local to um, St. Mary's Cusop, which is a, a nearby church. So, as you can see from the photo ref, as I was saying, it's not a very glamorous bird, but it's very beautiful. These kind of pale um, edges to the feathers are really important and are relevant when it comes to identifying the bird. Pale underbelly and sort of almost slight mottling or striation on the throat and on the area above the eyebrow, sort of brownish, brownish tail. So first thing to do is going to be to mix up the right colour, sort of brownish, it's a purplish brown. So yeah. The colour I've mixed here is a mixture of a dark brown. Um, in this case, this is burnt umber I'm pretty sure sometimes I forget the names of my um, paint colors and I'm sorry I know that's really unhelpful for you guys uh, this is a sort of bluish purple I'm not sure what purple it is it's a dark blue strong purple so I've mixed that in with with the umber and then also quite a lot of this which is Naples yellow so that's created the right color and the consistency pretty much that of cream it's not too watery you can see as I use it um, and often when I put paint on the brush I'll twirl the brush a little bit, which gives you a nice sharp point, if you can see that. Um, with my brush, something else that I do is when I dip it in water, when I pull it out again, I will often make sure 
that I use a tissue to get rid of any extra water which is hanging about on the ferrule because sometimes that can drip down and it can make your um, the paint that's actually on your brush much much more liquid and pale and harder to handle than you want okay so looking at my photo ref and looking at my illustration I can see that what I need to start by doing is plotting in these feathers now they've got these very pale edges um, so the a lot of these feathers and the coverts have paler edges but each feather also you've got to think about the anatomy of these things each feather also has a central it's almost like a central vein I think it's called a rachith although I'm not 100% sure birds are not my speciality but I'm going to start by putting that central rib in just very lightly maybe I'll zoom in so you guys can see a bit better so what I'm doing here is basically plotting in the first pass of these um these wing feathers so for each one they've got this central rashies and could you see I've made it darker on one side by putting the paint marks closer together and by distancing the paint marks a little on the other side it looks slightly lighter um, I'm double checking my reference because down here these feathers don't have those pale borders but look let me just show you here is there a distinction yes there is okay so I'm gonna gently draw in the edge there of that feather and then just do these parallel lines to represent the texture of the feather now feathers are incredible things as I'm sure you know and like I say birds aren't really my speciality but you just have to be impressed by nature so each feather has got this central rib the rashis um, and then these bits here each of these sides is known as a as a vein and they're made of each of these individual lines is meant to represent a barb so feathers are made of lots and lots of barbs and see I'm putting the lines closer together to make them darker and that's partly because I want one side to be darker than the other but it's also ooh, that's a bit too dark but it's also because um, it's being shadowed by that so each barb is almost like it branches so it has little edge bits coming off it which are called barbules anyway what's amazing about them is they have little hooks on and they hook onto each other so that if you look at a feather under a magnifying glass or possibly even if you're lucky enough under a microscope you'll see that they clutch onto each other by a system of hooks and sure you can separate the hooks again a bit like velcro but it does hold them together which you can imagine if you're flying you need a sort of a large area which is consistent and able to handle the air and things um, but yet at other times if you're preening and stuff you want to be able to get in amongst and between the the feathers and they'll separate out so yeah anyway I've explained that quite badly but if you have extra time and you want to be amazed just go and look up the structure of feathers because it is extraordinary when you think that they're made whoops of the same stuff as fur fingernails it's all from keratin then you do really have one of those moments where you're like oh my goodness nature's just so amazing so you can see all i'm doing here is literally it's the first pass i'm literally just putting in these marks okay and um and what we'll do is once these are all in then i'll come back again and put a top wash on and probably that will there'll be several top washes that's normally how i work i never really know ahead of time how, how long it's going to take uh, so i'm just going to crack on and plot in all these feathers and once these little parallel lines are done and the feathers are all ready to go we can talk about the next step 
Uh, one thing I will say is the lighter line you need with a paintbrush, the gentler the pressure. So if I press really gently, that line is absolutely tiny. The harder I press, the thicker the line is. And a little bit of variation as you sort of plot in these is no bad thing because there's variation in nature, right? It's not like computer made. You can see that I've worked into these feathers now. So all these ones up here, darker on that side, lighter on that side, leaving this pale margin. Um, and all the ones down here. Now these ones, they don't really have those pale edges in the same way. Um, and they're a slightly darker brown. But I wanted to make sure that there was a delineation between each of them so they don't just look like an amalgamous mass. So what I did was I outlined the edge of each and then blanked them in. So they do have a little bit of a white space between. Um, another thing that I often do at this point is just put in a shadow, which this is the same colour as before, just to separate those feathers. And this will get knocked back eventually, but it just is quite a useful way of adding a little bit more depth to the illustration. There we go. So you can see literally it's just one line. And my light source, as ever, is coming from the top left. So the shadow casts, looking out for that bit where it would be a different shape. So the shadow casts that way, cast towards the right diagonally. Um, I've also delineated the outside lines of all the feathers which I found quite useful. I had to do an awful lot of redrawing down here. It turned out that I'd, and when I drew it up I hadn't really concentrated very hard and a lot of the feathers are in the wrong place so it was all a bit chaotic but I think I've got a grip on it now more or less. And again I'm putting these shadows in here as well even though they're in the colour to do with up here because that will help unify the illustration. If you have the same colours running through, if you can, it can be quite handy. There we go. And those again will be casting shadows. So now what I'm going to do is work into the tail feathers. Um, so they're darker. So it'll. I'll show you. I'll show you what I've been doing with these ones. This colour that I've mixed is it's the same colours as before. So you've got a purple, a burnt umber and a Naples yellow, but it's in a slightly different configuration. So it's darker. Again, here we go. Turning the brush in the paint to get a nice point. And then plotting in these little tail feathers again. Here, the rush is incredibly important really gives structure and definition to the tail feathers. And I've drawn them in as having a bit of a margin, but they really don't. So I'm just going to have to bear that in mind. And again, we're doing exactly the same thing. These just building up these lines to give texture and depth. And do try and make sure that they're parallel to one another. If you start doing them at weird and funny angles, then you'll find it just doesn't trick the eye into thinking that it is actually something from nature. I spend my life trying to emulate nature, copy some of the beauties therein. It's just laughable, really. I never get close. Every time you look at something as simple as a blade of grass or, you know, one feather, you're like, OK, so this is so much cooler than anything I can ever replicate with my paints. But I find that, rather than disheartening, I find it inspiring. It's like, wow, better just keep going. because There's so much beauty to be inspired by. Okay, so this is, again, we're doing it like we did before. So I'm going to outline this, actually. So darker on the opposite side. Oh, that's wrong. Okay, just do that line again and maybe it'll work better that time. Excellent. And can you see on this side, I've already started painting a bit wrong. So by redrawing, I should be able to come in a little bit closer, possibly too close. I have to do. 
so yeah that'd be fine but that's okay because we want this we don't really want a white margin on the edge of the feathers on this and certainly not on this side so there we go bring it out like this you'll be pleased to know that the other feathers on the back and the chest and so on the head's always tricky because you that's where the eye always goes so you always focus on the head when you look at an illustration so you've got to make sure that's right but the chest feathers and the back and all that stuff are significantly easier. I do them actually exactly like I do fur. So again, I've done a little bit of redrawing on this um, bird. It's very important when, when you're illustrating, not just to sort of go with exactly what you think is there and be like, oh yeah, I've drawn it there, that must be right. Keep looking at your reference and keep thinking sort of logically. Would that be there, wouldn't it? And in this case, um, the tail was not the feathers of the tail were not quite where they should be so they needed redrawing and again I'm doing that thing that I said about outlining drawing a thin straight line is very difficult you have to keep the pressure consistent as you draw and you also need to try and keep the line more or less straight a good way of doing that is by instead of looking at the tip of your brush if you look at the point that you're aiming for so for example with this one as I'm moving the brush I'm looking down at the base of the tail not at the tip of the brush I also stop breathing which seems to help and again here's another one and this one there's some of the some of the feathers on the rump uh, covering it where it joins the body same again looking at the where it's aiming for and round we go so there we go and this is the last one Okay, and then on this side there is there's a bit of tail stuff coming on, but it's a it's a bit complicated, so I'm just going to try and keep it quite simple, just like that. That should do. And now I've got that there, it's much easier to work into it. So literally more of the same. Out come these lines. Um, so while I just plot in these ones with you, what can I tell you about? The flycatcher, the spotted flycatcher, Muschiapa striata. So it's quite a common bird. It's it's got a massive global range, sort of Europe, Africa, whatever. It's migratory, so it win overwinters in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, it comes up to Europe, and in Britain, it breeds kind of early spring through to the summer. Um, it's quite common, wonderfully. It's not on any red list. It's not about to go extinct. I read somewhere, I think, on bird life, there's between something between 50 million and 80 million adults. Nobody's quite sure because its distribution is so wide. So that's good. It's like, yay, I'm drawing something that isn't about to die out or go extinct. Makes a nice change. Um, and they're very cool. So they're in the flycatcher family. They're about the size of a European robin, more or less. Um, they look a little bit more elegant than some of the other flycatchers because their their wings and their tails are slightly longer, so the proportion of the body is slightly different. Um, and they fla they catch flies, but it's not only flies; they catch loads of insects. And I'm being a bit careful here because here I've left a white margin, here I haven't. Uh, so they do this; they'll they'll stake out a perch, normally on a tree or something like that, and they'll just hang out there, and then they'll dart out. And with really quite dramatic acrobatics, will catch their prey. So flycatchers, obviously, they go for dipterans, they go for flies, but they they catch other things. They catch damselflies if they can, butterflies, moths. Um, they even catch hymenoptera, things like wasps and bees. Um, and I read very coolly that if they have a flying beetles, I'll go for. If they have a, a wasp or a bee to avoid being stung, they take it back to its perch. They'll take it back to the bird's perch and they will rub the abdomen, the tip of the abdomen of the bee or wasp against the perch, which rubs off the sting. And then they can eat it without there being any detrimental effects, which is very, very cool indeed. Um, yeah, and they have they have three to five eggs in their little nests um, and they like, you know, sort of clearings and open ground you you might see them in the garden but as i say they're quite unobtrusive there because they're these non-dramatic colors you may really not even particularly notice 
or only see see one out of the corner of your eye unless you stop and watch um and if you do have if you do recognize a spotted flycatcher somewhere where you can watch it you'll see that they do have favorite perches to which they return again and again and again so you get to see a, a sort of a bespoke aerial display every time that the bird takes off to go and catch another food item um, they've got black legs, black beak, this kind of dingy brown grey tail, wings. This white out outlining is important. Um, paler chest and paler throat, which is slightly mottled. And yeah, so that's your, uh, that's your spotted fly catcher. So I'm just going to finish doing these um, and then I'll quickly show you how we go about doing all these areas which are the these areas sorry I didn't show you did I that was stupid of me all these areas up here which are um which are less sort of distinct but I'm just going to finish up with the tail for now I've mixed up some paint for the body and so on same colors still more Naples yellow and much more water. You can see it's much wetter now. Um, and this bit is actually quite easy. So the trick here is to make sure you don't go over any of your whites because obviously with watercolour painting, your whites tend to be the white of the paper glowing through the paint. So you really don't want to compromise that. So what I tend to do, you can probably see, maybe I should have been, can you see how there's little letters P, 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 all over. Those are to remind me to leave those as pale. Um, but the rest of it is, if we look at our photo reference, again, it's a bit weird, it's close up. But you can see all of that area is pretty consistently brown. This one, it's a different photo. It's greyer, but it's consistent. So all of this area has to just be blocked in. And I just do that very simply with lots and lots and lots of little lines, just all built up. I try and change direction a little bit, make it look a bit more realistic thinking about what is happening with a bird so you know these aren't flight feathers and they haven't got kind of sharp edges and things like that but this whole area is built of a whole network of feathers laid on top of one another so you don't want it to look just totally smooth and I guess in that way it is rather different from from fur which I was talking about earlier but at the same time you do want that color to be more like consistent so I'll just I'll just paint a little bit more so you can see. Just always following the, when I do botanical illustration, I always call it following the line of growth. It's not quite the line of growth, but you don't want to be going in a different direction to the way the feathers have been laid down. You want to be um, imitating the patterns of growth, whether that's a, a leaf or a feather or a petal. In this case, it's the feathers. So thinking about that, think about all the barbs that go to make up an individual feather. Think about them laid on top of each other. So if you actually had this bird and could see, each of these would be an individual feather. But in amongst each of these feathers, you've got a lot of down feathers, which are the fluffy ones that help provide warmth. So it's almost like a, a, whole, a whole network of feathers working together to keep the bird warm but also able to fly and speaking of being able to fly did you know i bet you did did you know that bird bones are hollow so if you've got a hollow bone it's going to weigh less yeah but they're also strong because you don't want to have a weak hollow bone that might just crumple midair so they're um they're braced i guess almost like an engineering project on the inside so sort of got triangular cross-sectional struts within feathers not within feathers, oh, Lucy, within bones. Very cool. So, yeah, we're just building it up. And you can see it doesn't look like totally realistic, but it looks, it's, it's good enough. You're just, you're getting the feel that there's feathers. I don't want to do too sharp of an edge here. If I were to delineate the edge of this, that would be less successful than with the larger feathers. Um, it would look sort of artificial, so I'm being a bit careful and do it down there. 
but then that looks like it's the edge of one feather that looks like the edge of another feather the edge of another one just kind of playing about with it a little bit to give you that depth that you need i'll do a bit more and then i'll just crack on and fill in that space it's all very much the same just lots of little parallel lines next to each other building up texture building up color and just trying to bring the bird to light and i'm not changing the color here so this is still a consistent color throughout we will we'll add different colors at a later stage but for now we're just laying down that texture laying down that color and trying to get the areas of white on the page to a greater or lesser extent covered so that it looks more like a bird and less like a pencil drawing you can see how the feathers are all building up so that's all going all right i haven't done anything down here yet but then this color is slightly different it's a, a yellow so far we're still we're still using just those three colors i haven't touched another color other than naples yellow burnt umber and purple yet um so now i'm moving into the head yeah, there's a bit of detail of the back you can see lots of different little marks oh and just more of those marks here to suggest a little bit of darkness at the nape of the neck uh, when you get into the head it's all a bit scary because you have to make those marks that much smaller and you also have to be that much more careful so i have put a dark circle around the eye you can see that and this here it is just a marking part of the mottling but it helps anchor it helps anchor the illustration so i'm just finishing up the markings on the head now i really don't want the pale to be at the top of the head because that won't work for us so there we go just again building into these little marks and so there's not quite stripes oh, there's a hair on the paper that's no good they're not quite stripes um over the eye they're kind of kind of mottled little spots and so on but they're almost in a striped array so i'm just trying to make sure this top line is dark but is also consistent and doesn't look weird okay that's right um so as i'm doing this i really am checking on my reference all the time like every second every sort of 15 seconds i'm checking to make sure that the marks i'm making are echoing the reference and again this is why it's useful to have lots of different forms of reference not just one image so you'll see different things because each bird is individual so their markings are individual but you can kind of see what the general gist is so there are these kind of almost lines of lines of mottled more paleness mottled more paleness i've lost the language lost the use of the human language so here i've made lots of markings i'm not quite sure which is meant to be light and which is meant to be dark i know the top of the head has got to be dark We're now into this territory where I'm holding my arm at an angle because I'm filming and it's always around this time that I tend to get my hair under the camera. So hopefully I'll avoid that today. Okay. Yeah, and that is, I mean, that is quite dark, the top bit. I don't want to misrepresent it. And right in front of the eyes, the hairs, but the, the hairs, the feathers become really quite little and, and, and quite sort of discreet and detailed so we need to reflect that with our brush strokes keeping them quite small quite discreet maybe think about our stripes not allowing any area to be too bold or too large and just gently pulling out that dark around the eye into that paler area above the eyebrow superciliary i think that's what they might call it if you're a birder Sure, you lot, but no more than I do. There's often a line like this, so it, that's there. So again, can you see how much smaller the the brush marks I'm making are at this point in time? And again, we're leaving the areas white, but we just want to make sure this line particularly. Ah, that's no good. You've got to be very careful because if you change the line of direction of your strokes then it changes the whole feel and actually it makes it much darker than you might otherwise want it to be so always stay light and go darker rather than going too dark all of a sudden so 
you know, this is this is a lot. This stage is really quite tricky. It's all about looking and observing and trying to be true to your subject and true to the written description descriptions of what makes that species look very much like that species. So we're nearly there now, actually, with all of these preliminary markings. So I'll finish off the head and then I'll talk briefly about down here the flank area. There we go. The head is complete with these mottled markings. Um, also, you need to figure out where the beak ends and the feathers begin. Right where you get in here, the feathers really are almost just hairs rather than feathers. So you need to reflect that in the smallness of your um, in the smallness of your brush strokes. So now we're going to move on to oh, and I also put these little flecks here. I'm even going to zoom in on them more if I can. These flecks here on the throat. Um, because they're there, they're little mottled things. But literally, you can see there, each of them is sort of four or five tiny brush marks. But then when you zoom out, it doesn't look nearly as rubbish. It's always good. Uh, OK, now for the rump and for the flank, which is this area here. Bearing in mind these legs are black. We'll do those later. So we actually, for the first time in ages, we've mixed up a new colour. So there's been a touch of this one, which is still uh, burnt up, ugh, burnt umber purple naples yellow touch of that in there a lot more naples yellow and the tiniest tiniest literally just a touch and then a drop of cadmium orange in here and you can see it's quite um watery so that's intentional because we know that this area is pale right so we don't want it to get too thick and dark with paint but it still needs to have some delineation in it I'm also looking at that. I'm not convinced by that. That line there doesn't seem quite right to me. So I'm going to rub it out. It's not far off. It's a little bit dodgy. Yeah. Okay, so again, ha, huh, get a pencil that works. Um, again, this is what I was saying about all the time when you're drawing. Keep looking. There, yeah, that's better. And redrawing, you can always redraw. And even with your paintbrush, obviously, you redraw with your paintbrush. Now, look at my photo ref. Most of this coloration on the on the flank and stuff is sort of here. So this bit is the flank, which is quite pale, and then this bit here it comes down to what's known as the rump. And the rump's got a bit of colour on it, but so I'm just going to start light because I can always take it darker, but I can't get back to lighter if I mess up. So just Plotting that in right up to where we've been doing the feathers of the wing. It's almost like two different sections. So it's like there's a front bit here, which is paler. And then there's this bit. So we want to show that delineation. But we also want it to be a natural gradation of colour. Definitely in the photo ref that I've got in all cases. It's darker up here. Now this line here, this pencil line here, I can see why I put that there. But again, looking at the reference, looking at the picture, I really don't want it to be that defined because it would give an artificial air. It would add a part of the body, a, a lump and a bump to the body, which isn't there. So I don't really want that. So again, just look and draw, look and draw, look and draw. That's what we're doing so much of the time. Uh, okay, so we're with our rump. I'm keeping that colour really light. Can you see I'm barely touching the barely touching the page with the brush? But you're just slowly building up a little bit of colour, a little bit of depth. So I can see what I've done here. So there is um there is a line here, but it's not nearly as it's not as pronounced and it doesn't go as I think I'm gonna use it like that. So what you can do, I shouldn't be doing this when the paint is still wet, or with a paintbrush in my mouth, hence me sounding like I'm growling. I'm going to rub that out so that it stops misleading me. Never rub out um, wet paint. Don't do that. It's not going to work. I want that to be there because that is a distinction. Okay, that feels a bit better. It feels more realistic to me. Okay, so we're not only talking about colour here. I mean, there is this, this flash of kind of yellowish. But we're also talking about shadow. So this bit down here is definitely darker. But it's not darker because it's got that yellow hue to it. It's darker because it's in the shade. 
I don't know. In some of the reference here, this 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 area has got a lot more pink in than in others. So I think I'm going to avoid the pink because it's not in every single one. Could be something going on with the camera. So I'm just going to bring this up. Don't want to make any of this too distinct because it is quite kind of gentle, quite subtle up here. And that's above the tail. You can see. Bring these lines down a little bit. Okay. The undertail really does look pretty much like it's white. Um, I'm going to put a tiny bit of this yellow in just for consistency because if you just suddenly drop a colour when you're painting, your eye sometimes casts around looking for it and you can feel stuck visually. I'm going to put a little bit in there, but I'm going to keep that really light because there isn't a lot of it there. Um, I am going to bring that same colour into here a little bit. In fact, this colour, I'm going to I'm going to bring a lot of it into the, the rest of the feathers and stuff at some point, but not quite yet. OK. And a little bit up here as well. Not too much. Don't want to make it a bird with a yellow chest because that is not what the spotted flycatcher is. But we do want a bit of colour in those chest feathers. And the fluffiness. So think about the texture of the feathers as you paint as well. Think about the kind of softness. What would it what might it feel like to, to touch the bird? Oh, you don't want it to be all sharp edges, do you? Okay, keeping this. Can you see how light I'm trying to keep this? It's not probably not perfect, but if you compare the the brush strokes, maybe I'll zoom in because it is very pale. If you compare the brush strokes, which you can barely see actually, because it's such a pale colour. If you compare them to the 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 stronger lines that we did further up, you'll see it's a, it's a very different sort of mark. We don't want any stark contrasts or changes of colour or shade or anything like that. You just want to keep it all very light. Very light. Okay. There we go. So that's now because we've got that yellow in here as well. It echoes the yellow further down and it makes us feel that yep this bird is one thing, it's an entity. And I think it's a little bit of that. I'm not sure how much of this colour there is up here, but in order to make the eye do the work for us, we're going to bring a little bit up onto the epaulettes, onto the shoulders. And we are going to bring some of this same colour, the same light approach, sort of in amongst. Like this, we're keeping it very light. Can you see? Keeping the touch very light. Don't want it to go too yellow, but I need there to be consistency across the the feathers of the bird. I've mixed up another colour, so this one is also a kind of brownish grey. So this one is cobalt blue, plus that burnt umber, plus a tiny bit of Naples yellow. So it's a slightly different colour, and I'm going to start working into these wings and stuff. So if you see what I've done with our pale yellow wash is there's plenty of it around here, around the rump and, and around the flanks. And I've carried it through on the pale areas of the head, but also on the main area where the feathers are to try and get some kind of some depth of colour um, and it's sort of working okay so what I'm going to do now with this kind of grey brown that I've got is ooh, what am I going to do with it that is a good question should I do a top wash all right so that's what I'm going to do so I've got all the delineate I've got the marks of the feathers made because that's what we did to start with right so now oh, I'm trying to hold this so it's not shining there we go so this is the consistency of the paint I'm diluting it with pure water make it really quite runny 
and quite pale so I think you can tell and again rolling the brush to get a point and then what I'm going to do heart in mouth time is just put that oh that's quite a lot darker than I wanted it to be put that top wash over and cut into the paler edges of the feathers but I'm not going to not going to totally swallow them okay Let's see how this is going to work Sometimes you just have to take your heart in your mouth and give it a give it a go and see whether it's going to work or not. This I think felt too dark, but maybe it's not too dark. But uh, I do need to respect these um paler edges and make sure that I don't swallow up all of that. Okay. So I'm treating each um each of these feathers as a kind of individual block colouring it in really making sure that I'm not overlapping so when I put oh crikey that's too dark so when I put a wash on this feather I absolutely am not going to allow any of that pool of paint to go onto the feather below it or above it because they need to be independent of one another at this stage So you can still see through the watercolour wash all the detailing of the individual barbs of each feather that shows through despite the colour but it becomes less kind of in your face which is a good thing. Okay, just realised I was off screen then, sorry guys. Um, now these ones, because you remember what we did with these being darker on one side than the other, so I'm going to put down an initial wash here. Doing exactly the same thing, overlapping some of that pale edge. Ooh, but hopefully not swallowing the whole thing. I'm kind of making this up as I go along. It's, it's doing what I wanted to do. Um, the other thing that I've also done was I painted in the gravestone with all the lichen on that the bird is sitting on. I didn't bother sharing that with you because it's quite... A... <laughs> It's quite a specific thing. I very much doubt that if you're going to paint birds, you're necessarily going to put them on gravestones. So we're just kind of working into the feathers, giving them a bit of depth, giving them a bit of colour. Not going too dark because we still need those areas of light. But just building up the body colour. So I'm going to do that across all the feathers and come back to you. This colour seems to be working quite well, so do you remember I was saying about doing two layers, one on the dark side and then when you lay it over on the light side as well, and over the rushies, looks like there's more depth. Just Ooh, try to respect that little line, it's not paler in real life, it's not like the... Um, it's not like the primary and the secondary feathers and the wing coverts, but we're going to make it paler because we need to leave a line there to help the eye distinguish between the different feathers. Um, and again, covering in, colouring in the rashis there. And you know, I always bang on about follow the line of growth, follow the line of growth. In this particular case, you actually don't need to because you're, it's a light wash. And you're not going to compromise anything by not following the exact line of the feather barbs. Okay, so if we zoom out for a second, let's see how we're getting on. Okay, it looks all right. Uh, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a very dilute, I mean, this is already dilute, right? But I'm going to use even more dilute by adding clean water gray there we are. really dilute and put a wash over the rest of the bird's feathers i'm a bit nervous about this because i'm not quite sure what i'm planning to do when i get to the the bit where the head goes paler anyway i'll probably figure it out as i go along it's normally what happens so yeah i know that there's quite a lot of and i'm i'm going i'm going into the paint pot as I go along now 
sorry no I'm not I'm going into the water pot to dilute a little bit I'm moving quite fast I don't want to have any tide marks where water has been allowed to dry on the feathers and again using kind of feathery marks to blend them in so far so good it'll do okay so I seem uh -huh, that's what I seem to be doing so in the bits that are paler I seem just to be taking them up into the marks and blending them in without compromising the pale areas too much. Only time will tell whether that is a good or a bad approach. A bit of colour up here in these markings. Blending everything in with confident, confident quick brush strokes. And now I've got to be really careful that I don't put my hand on that side of the bird and then smudge it everywhere because that is quite likely to happen at this point in time. You have to be quite courageous a lot of time when you're doing an illustration. So I know this film's quite long, but um, I've been actually working on this illustration for longer because, of course, I've been doing bits and pieces in between the filming. So if I were to mess the whole thing up now, it would, wouldn't be a disaster, but it'd be super irritating so some of the marks overlay the pale areas some don't it's enough to blend the colors in but it's not so much that you lose the pale mottled areas and same all the way up to the beak and you can get away with this because that top wash that we mixed up is so watery so dilute that it does it shows but it's not gonna create any massively dramatic effect that you're going to regret and have to throw the painting away um okay so what do i have to do next now i have to deal with those edges don't i i'm actually going to have to stop for a second and consider what i'm going to do about that you'll be pleased to know i've decided what to do about these wings um but these wing <laughs> wing feathers so i had a lot of a look at a few more bits of reference and there's a slight brownness i, I want to draw attention to the whiteness well, to the paleness at the edge. But I don't want to, that to be so stark that it's the only thing you see. So I'm drawing attention to it by using a little brown right up to the edge. And that brown is a mix of burnt umber and quite a lot of yellow ochre. And if you remember, we had a look. Did we use yellow ochre when we were doing the body? Maybe we did, maybe we didn't. I can't remember. Anyway, it certainly echoes some of the colours elsewhere in the illustration, so that's no bad thing. Again, it's just softening the edge, can you see? Um, and then I will put a top wash over the whole lot. But so this is what I'm doing now, literally just working along the edges, little marks. Trying to draw attention to the white without making it stark. And also making it feel a bit different from the other feathers by adding that slight brown. So I'm going to do that over all the feathers which have the margin now. So I'm not sure, um, maybe you can see the difference that adding these little bits of brown has done. It's knocked back the whites but it hasn't made them disappear completely. And you can see really it's either just doing lines or tiny little dabs with that slightly orangish mix. So the whole area is now kind of wet and I really want to let it dry before doing anything else to it. So we need to turn our minds instead to here. So the ch chest area. So we've got that little bit of that flash of colour. And like I say, there's a lot of different bits of reference. So all the different pictures that I have show slightly different things going on there. Um, but I do know that we want some shadow here and I... Always use a very similar mix for shadows. So it'll be cobalt blue and purple. Normally that's all I do, but in this case I'm going to do a touch of green to echo or reflect the gravestone that the bird is sitting on. So let me mix that up. So this is the colour I've mixed up. It's a kind of darkish bluish, like I say, cobalt blue, purple, and a little bit of this green, which is cobalt green, is quite a sort of thick 
not very bright green. Um, it's quite dilute, probably not dilute enough, but I'm going to try it on the darkest area, which is just here where the lead comes in. And if I press lightly enough, then perhaps it'll do the trick. It's the right colour. Oh no, that's fine. Okay, so now I'm going to use this, now that I've realised it's not too dark. I'm very lightly, I mean this really, this is about as light of a touch as you're going to get. Just use that, just so that you, are, that you know where the edge of the, um, where the edge of the bird is. And also, you know, there are shadows here, of course there are, because in amongst the feathers, the feathers lie on top of each other, so therefore that inevitably, shadows are cast. Oop, I'm just doing a solid line down there. Um, and then again, with care, up here under the wing. And you've got to be a bit careful with your colour mixes. So this is quite yellowish. And we've got some blues in here. <clears throat> so it is going to make this part of the bird slightly greenish. Now I'm perfectly comfortable with that because there's greens in the gravestone. But you do need to be, a care, be aware when you're painting, if you add different layers of colours, that there's going to be optical mixing on the page, not just in your paint box. So to delineate the edge, that shadow bit that I put over the whole bird, I'm now just going to bring this down along the front of the breast area. That will all do, I suppose. We're getting there, you know. We're not far off now. We need one more colour wash, I think. So I'm going to zoom out. So you can see exactly where we are so far. Uh... Yeah, we need one more wash, and that's going to go over everywhere except for the chest. Are you guys bored of all the layers of washes yet? <laughs> I bet you are. Right, so this one is it's kind of grey, really, isn't it? So it's um, a tiny bit of yellow ochre, a tiny uh, some burnt umber and some cobalt blue, and it's very, very liquid. So I'm going to whap that over the whole bird except for the chair, except for the um, except for this bit. Okay, here goes. It's quite green, but again, I spoke to you about the green before, not really a problem for me. Now let's see how those little white edges work when they're swallowed up by a watercolour wash. Hopefully it'll all be okay. If you're looking at this and thinking, crikey, that seems a little wild, then yeah, it, it is. And it I do feel terrified at moments like this. You think, am I messing up the whole thing? You never know until you've done it. Now, what about the head? Woo! Zoom in for this. So, same mix. What am I going to do? I'm putting big blobs of it here in the middle of the darks. So, what I'm going to do is going to put big blobs in the middle of the darks. And before anything sets, definitely, I'll dilute it and bring it into the whole thing. There we go. So I'm trying to move really fast now. Because I don't want the paint to dry like anything is ever going to dry. It's been raining non-stop for about six years now. Um, and now this is just clean water, right? So that is pure water. But because there is still colour, because the paint is wet, I'm able to move that around a little bit. I've got to be really careful. I'm in danger of losing my definition now. If you put too much detail on, you can lose some definition, which you don't really want to do. A tiny bit of the same colour. There. Just to unify the whole thing. That's it. That's the, that's the colour done, basically. Let's have a look if I zoom out. You can see. So the colour is done. And now we're just down to putting details in and blacks and whites. Not blacks and whites. Ah! Uh, details and shadows. 
Well, I'm relieved to say <coughs> that it's dried all right, actually. Um, it took ages to dry. I had to get my little fan heater on it and stuff. But the coloration, it's working. I'm quite pleased with it. So the next thing we're going to do is do some of the details. So the legs and the beak. And in this bird, in the spotted flycatcher, both are black. Now, I don't like using straight blacks from my paint box, although I do have one, which I occasionally use. I prefer to mix them up myself. So this black is a mixture of purple, um, burnt umber, and um, thallo blue, a kind of a kind of greenish, cold, dark blue. So what I'm going to do is start working into, I think, legs first and then the beak. Legs first and then the beak. So these are the way I do this is I put in the details on the legs before coming back with a top wash. I don't really want the legs to be that important. They're not really the focus of the illustration. And as you can see from the mess I've made drawing them up, I do find bird legs still quite a challenge to draw. You want to get them right. You don't want them to be too thin or spindly, but you don't want them to be enormous. And <clears throat> you need to be as honest as you can be about things like claws and the way that the bird actually sits. Now then, the claw. And the claw is also black. Okay. Woo, scary times. Okay, so with the claw, I'm going to turn it in the page. You can always, bear in mind, you can always move your page around so that it's in the best position for you to paint on. Oh, it's another of those moments when it's best not to breathe. They come up quite often when you're doing illustration. The non-breathing moments. Okay, good. That claw's fine. It's not quite spiky enough, but it's good enough. And the other leg, as you can see, I very cheekily just sent it the other side of the gravestone, which actually anatomically makes no sense. What is that foot doing? But shh, maybe the, maybe the client won't notice. And again, always redrawing, even at this late stage. You see something that you've drawn <clears throat> and you think, eh, I'm not sure that's right. Double check your reference and redraw. And the beak. Ah! Okay, double check your reference, take a deep breath. Put it in the right position for you when you're painting. It's not as scary as the eye. The eye is the scariest of all. Well, I leave it till the end. Also, I don't like my subjects staring at me as I paint them. They always look very accusatorial. Okay, so leaving a little bit on the top of the lower mandible. Okay, and then that beetle leg does that, does that, does that. Don't want that. My arm. Okay. I don't really want the junction of the beetle's leg to be where it is. I'm going to move it in a minute. Now I've got to get this curve right. Yep. It's another of those moments where you don't want to breathe. Um, so, we've got this bit here. The nostril. Which is dark and light below and top of the beak I want to be quite nice and dark I don't want it to be the darkest thing has to be the pupil of the eye you see so you need to be a bit careful Don't mess up now. Don't mess up now. Okay. 
and again there's a little bit of a margin And there's a pale area in front of the nostril, slightly. And the beak is shiny. So we're leaving a bit of white on it in the middle zone. And the bird's mouth is open. So we're going to mix a bit of black. I'm not going to show you this mix, there's no real need bit of black with a bit of red to make a really dark sort of reddish brown and that'll be this part of the bird's open throat yep that actually is going to be a problem because there isn't that color anywhere else in the painting so we'll have to find a place to put it in we might put a little bit of it in the beak we can get away with that So with these, I'm using the black and I've literally just made a tint of the black. So I've just added some clean water to it. And I'm adding a tiny bit of that purple of the bit of the bird's mouth. Just because I need to continue that colour. Just a little bit at the back of each of the scales on the legs. I hope they're called scales. I don't really know what they're called. Legs have been <clears throat> plotted in and are now dry. So... A uh, quick top wash, that's the same black, but with some of that purple in. To add a little bit of interest and auto to echo the, the beak thing. I'll whap it on top, it's that simple. Make sure it's not too thick. Oh, it's probably a little bit too dark. Let's see if I can dilute it in time. Maybe, maybe not. It's not a disaster because the legs aren't that important. But okay, I'm going to use a blotter to lift some of the ink off that bottom toe. That's a bit better. It's lost some of our definition, it's not the end of the world. Never panic when you're illustrating. If you're painting and you mess it up, just think of the quickest and easiest way to try and fix it. It's all about knowing how to fix your mistakes. There we go. So that's done, the feet are done. And I also have plotted in the insect, just kind of like a beetle. I haven't put the wings in, but I don't think anybody's going to notice. Um, okay. Well, you know what we've got left to do now, don't you? Got the eye, which is terrifying. Um, okay. So, with the eye, in all the photos, the eye just looks black, but we know that's the eye. So I'm going to mix up a good colour for the eye. The iris of the eye is going to be this kind of reddish brown, so there's some kind of purple in there. Different purple, this is a much redder purple than the other one I was using. And a kind of reddish brown. <clears throat> but you need to get some variation in there. Right, I'm going to zoom into the eye. Scary times. <laughs> and if I swear, I apologise. For me, this is the most stressful bit of any illustration is doing the eye. So... Putting in that colour up at the top, that in the middle is the pupil, which will be blank. Making sure the pupil is round, because it is. And there's a bit of light here. Can you see that white spot? It's going to be a highlight, so I don't want to Colour that in and I want to allow get the amount of scope for the colour of the eye to become brighter and paler closer to where the light is hitting it. We need to know that the iris is there the whole way around. Well, I'm adding a little bit of a warm yellow to my mix. And a tiny bit of a kind of reddish orange. <clears throat> it's 
just trying to give a bit more texture to the eye rather than just brushing it and doing it flat. And that pure yellow. Mm, that looks a bit rubbish. Using a brighter yellow now to try and lift that. It's unlikely it'll work. Yeah, I've lost some of the fluidity of the eye there. That's a shame. I'm going in with a orange to try and fix it and I'm going to go in with a bit more of a darker orange to try and fix it so there's still contrast going on and now again with my original eye colour yeah now we've one back a little bit of that kind of luminosity haven't we okay and now the pupil we'll have mixed our black so we'll use that one but i'm adding a little bit more dark blue to it to make it a slightly darker different black still black Mm, that's not too bad we might be able to live with that we need to make that circle more complete without compromising the eye the iris of the eye so yeah this is where we are right now so we're nearly there we're closing in yeah i'm gonna have to fix eye shine that's a bit too blatant um and now i'm gonna do the shadow first bit of doing the darks is sit back take a look what actually in amongst the markings needs darkening so this needs darkening and the eye thing needs darkening and a little bit there and then I'll drop in some shadows under the tail feathers and under the wing feathers I've done a bit of um crisping up of just with a darker brown going around the edges there aren't that many real dark darks but I'm now gonna these look a bit pale now, annoyingly. I might have to put another wash on them. I don't know if the page can take it. Um, I'm now going to mix up a purple and a blue. I haven't got much space left on my... <laughs> There's the purple and the blue. I haven't got much space left on my um, palette, actually. Adding a little bit of grey into that. And I'm going to put in some shadows. So... Why can you see and why can't you see? You can see here. Between the tail feathers, we'll have a little bit of shadows. And likewise below the tail. Trying to make sure that this is still on film. Where it lands on the lichen and the gravestone. going to be casting a shadow a bit there. now of course the question is do I take my heart in my hands and do a drop shadow under the wing I will I think it normally tends to look quite good okay but first we'll do these ones a little bit just crisping up failing to breathe Just if you get your shadows right, it just makes everything much crisper. I quite like that. Okay, and now that thing I was saying about the wing. So this is much more dilute.
and may as well oh crikey it's not working down here may as well down here as well okay there's very little opportunity now for me to destroy this painting but it's never done till it's done so popping in a couple more shadows here i think we can probably more or less call that done thank you for watching this video of me painting the spotted flycatcher uh, it was done for Cusop Churchyard, which will have some information panels on the flora and fauna going up. Well worth a visit, Cusop Church. It's a beautiful, beautiful old church dating back to Norman times. It's got a Norman font and um, all sorts of history associated with it. And some pretty rare fungus grows there as well. The earth star, um, a specific species of British earth star, which is only found in a few other locations. Anyway. So, yeah, the, the illustration is done. As you can see, a lot of it is you just look at the picture, you go back, you add depth, you look at the picture, you go back, you add depth. So there's layers and layers of um, colour and shadow and detail that go in. But eventually, yeah, eventually you come up with an illustration. And even if it is a comparatively unglamorous creature, such as this one, um, you can still create something which is which is quite quite decent. So, yeah, I'm quite pleased with that. Like I say... Thank you very much for um, watching. If you would like to see more of my work, please visit lizzieharper.co.uk where you can find originals for sale, numerous blogs, um, loads and loads of galleries of illustrations that I've done. Uh, and do feel free to like and subscribe and uh, leave questions and comments um, and queries. I always try and get back onto them. Um, yeah, thanks again for your time. Thanks a lot. Bye.